The Rolex Milgauss is still an underrated watch today, which is crazy to think, considering where the attention lies in the brand. All things considered, we could say that the Milgauss is probably the most unsuccessful professional model that they have ever made. And this is when we go back to its inception until now. It has never been a popular model. We can see over its history how it has had to adapt and develop in order to fall in line with many of the watches where the interest was. It just never stuck. It never carried over. But the developmental history of this watch is fascinating. More than that, though, if we refer to the underratedness of the piece, let's put price and demand aside. It's underrated because it represents things. It represents a watch of a bygone era, but it also represents a bittersweet end to that era, especially when we look at the design development of Rolex as a brand as it stands now, when we compare it next to how it was 10 years ago. This video is going to unpack the Milgauss a lot more, give you a brief history overview. We can discuss their designs and what makes them so well represented for their respective eras, as well as talk about how the chapter of the Milgauss might close very soon. The 1950s, a golden era for sports watch design, professional watch development. Next to the Submariner, the GMT, and the Turnograph, we saw the introduction of the Milgauss. A watch born of necessity, because in Switzerland, in 1951, we saw the establishment of the CERN Hadron Collider for particle physics. Remember that, around that time, science was extremely popular. During the 50s, we had figures that were considered celebrities, rock stars, like Feynman, Einstein. And like most of the other professional models that were created at the time, Rolex wanted to make a watch that would aid and assist scientists and engineers in environments that were harsh to be around. The external source that is out of our control, especially for pilots, engineers, and scientists, is magnetism. In their line of work, magnets are everywhere. And back then they were dealing with watches and technology that was far less superior than it is today. The simple premise around the Milgauss, milli being a thousand, Gauss being the unit of measure for magnetism, a thousand Gauss anti-magnetic resistance, was considered a very high rating. And we saw other manufacturers developing concepts around the same time, like IWC and the Ingenieur. And by 1954, we saw the introduction of the 6543, one of the most bizarre models that has ever been created by Rolex. The belief is that these early generations of 6543s were made in small numbers. There were a couple of variants, some having straight hands, others having lightning bolt hands, some having honeycomb dials, some without. Most of these were made to be a proof of concept more than anything else, the belief is. And all of them had one thing in common, a simple iron Faraday cage that surrounded the movement. Compared to the more recognizable models of that era in the professional line, like the Submariner, the GMT, even the Turnograph, they all had a similar style to the way their dials were addressed. But this thing was completely different. The quarter Arabics were these jagged triangles which resembled something more of an oyster perpetual and not so much a professional model. The same can be said about the hour and the minute hand. The use of a rotating bezel insert with these jagged arrows emphasize it even more. And in fact, it's a style that represents the 1950s so well, a lot more than the other models in this professional line. The 50s was a time of reviving 30s deco inspirations, and we can see that clearly with this example. But surprisingly, it was a piece that received criticism. It wasn't one that was worn by many scientists and professionals. Often it was cited as being a submariner or a turnograph, it looks almost identical to one or the other from a distance. In a strange development from the reference 6543, they moved to the reference 6541, which is odd. You'd expect the smaller reference number to be first, but in fact, it was second. And what they did with this model to try and create more attention, try to break away from that stigma of a turnograph or submariner, is they got rid of the rotating bezel. And this helped in creating a peculiar look, one that pretty much defined how the Milgauss would later be seen. But even then, it was not a popular model. In fact, there are stories about how this watch was awarded to athletes and professionals once they had won racing events, especially at the Indianapolis and Daytona 500, where you would expect to see the famous Rolex chronograph being awarded. In fact, many of these Milgasses were given instead, primarily because they just weren't selling. They just weren't in demand. With regards to how many of these watches actually were in circulation and used by scientists and engineers, it's difficult to tell. What all of us can agree on is that these variances of the Milgas, the first generation pieces, are extremely hard to find. And in fact, maybe the rarest 
of the professional Rolex models that you can possibly find today. So since these early professional models weren't seen as anything special, which is peculiar to think, especially when we look at the lightning bolt seconds hand and many other little factors that define this watch. The 60s arrived and we saw the introduction of the 1019, a tamer and more attentive generation of the Milgauss. A black dial, a champagne dial, essentially a jazzed up oyster perpetual with a few tricks up its sleeve. But again, through these years, the marketing wasn't good enough and these models didn't last very long. Even though their designs are beautiful, that level of restraint is something we just don't see anymore. The accent of red for Milgauss that corresponds with the red arrow tip on the second hand, something that was previously implemented in the first generation, but here it looks so much more appropriate so much more considered and refined. We look to the handset of the watch, perfect length for the hour and the minute hand. In fact, it is such a well-balanced dial arrangement, complemented again by the minute track that runs around the outside. Since these were going to be used for scientific purposes and more of an observation watch, you need to be accurate with your seconds and know what you're reading. The quarter batons at the three, six, and nine were slightly larger, a bit more emphasized, the overall result is a watch that is a Rolex that encapsulates those early years of restraint and an understanding of the watch's purpose and its design intent. This model, though once again wasn't received well, shows a clear understanding about its purpose. And naturally, the 1019 today is extremely rare and hard to find. This continued in 1988 and then the Milgauss name went cold until, I believe, 2007. The introduction of the reference 116400 now, with all the new technology, all the new toys, accent colors in the shape of a typical Oyster Perpetual. The first generations of this model were the most restrained. A few accent colors that changed its appearance, but other than that, it looked like your typical everyday wearing watch. The one thing they all have in common, though, is the orange lightning bolt seconds hand, which we will elaborate on later. Then, as an anniversary, they released the 116400 GV, with a couple of other updates on the outside, like the minutes now represented as numerals, the quarter Arabics having a faux patina look to them, as well as a green crystal, something that has now defined what the modern Milgauss looks like today. And lastly, the same reference introduced with Z Blue attached to its name, the dial being of zirconium, which is by far one of the most charismatic, enigmatic, charming watches that Rolex now makes in the professional line. In fact, this watch is still for sale, along with a few others. In a video that I made about two years ago, I try to express my feelings about the design of this watch and how it has captured the Milgauss so excellently. The simple theory is that it began as a professional watch, something of the 50s. It had a seriousness to it, but it also had a bit of playfulness. As we moved to the 1019, we saw that level of restraint being introduced. It also worked extremely well for the watch, but it looked like it was going in a completely different direction. By the time we reached this third generation, this modern stage of the Milgauss, we see that cross-pollination of modernity, but also playfulness. The reuse of the lightning bolt seconds hand that defined the 50s model in an Oyster Perpetual case that pretty much defined the watch as we moved from the 60s onwards. On top of that, the choice of introducing bright spot colors, a different tone of glass, which I don't believe any other professional watch in the Rolex category has ever done then or since. The choice of going further by introducing a sunburst blue dial that clashes with all the other colors. Could we say that it is a model that represents science and all the wonder surrounding it? I believe so. And that's why I find it to be such a successful final idea. But here's the thing about the Milgauss name and the watches that have come before it. It's a piece that represents a different time. The name itself is so irrelevant today, especially since most watches are anti-magnetic to over 15,000 Gauss. A thousand Gauss means nothing. We could say the same for names like the 50 Fathoms, but more than anything, it represents a footprint in time from a historical standpoint. Creatively then, this is when the final line steps in. That it not only represents the end of an era, but as a creative endeavor. I don't believe we will ever see Rolex as bold, as excitable with their professional models again. This piece has been around for almost a decade and it is going to be discontinued very soon. I think we can all agree on that. We have seen how the development of their professional models now follow a more structured format, one that doesn't deviate too far away from the brief. Most of the outlandish creative work we are now seeing has been handed over to Tudor. They can be a lot more experimental with their professional models. And if Rolex were to be more experimental with their models, they would look to the Datejusts. They would look to the Oyster Perpetuals, not the professionals. Question we could ask for bonus points, what could they do to this model to evolve it if they decide to do so? 
and I believe they would revert back to looking at the 1019 for inspiration. It is a foolproof idea, and ironically, in a similar way to how the watch evolved from the 50s to the 60s, we can see the same thing happening again. A cycle of a watch that began as an outlandish piece of design, then turning into something more restrained. No doubt, if it was to be done, implemented maybe in a 39mm case size, this piece would have a great reception, and more importantly, the name would live on. So this final generation of the Milgauss stands as something special. We could say it represents the final hoorah, displaying the brand as it was. It has a name that has been associated to history. It shows us some of these 50s aesthetics now that maybe haven't dated as well as some of its contemporaries, but is also representative of a lot more than just its popularity. And that is what is special about it.